We've discussed how the wave function for the particle in the box was developed and how to use it. That can be used as a model for an atom, but it has some obvious limitations since it's only a simple box. We'll now see how this process is extended to the hydrogen atom. To do that, we'll first review the Bohr model of an atom and briefly discuss the historical developments of the equation that describes the energy levels in the hydrogen atom. Finally, we'll derive the Rydberg equation. In earlier videos, we discussed the historical development of an atom. Eventually, we reached the Bohr model. The Bohr model said that electrons orbited the nucleus at defined intervals. These energy levels were quantized. And now we can start filling in details and talking about these and talk about these energy levels values and give an equation for them. I have shown the equation for the energy levels here and we'll go into more detail on these in later parts of the video. Something I didn't mention before but that is very important is that this model only holds up for one electron systems. We can use it for hydrogen and one electron ions, but anything with multiple electrons requires a more complicated model. There are two different ways that we'll talk about to solve for the energy levels of a hydrogen atom. They turn out to be completely equivalent, but they were developed extremely differently. Rydberg equation was developed experimentally by Rydberg, who was analyzing line spectrum. We'll talk about line spectrum in a different video. The Schrodinger equation was developed by solving the Schrodinger equation was developed very differently. Here, Schrodinger worked through the quantum theory as we talked about doing for the particle in the box. Either method yields the same result. Schrodinger's is just a little bit more detailed because it has more constants in there. And this, these two are also only going to be good for hydrogen-like atoms. Here are the results derived from the Schrodinger equation. This, once again, was done just like the particle in the box method that we did in earlier videos, but we're gonna skip the math on this one. So here's the results. The energy value consists of all of these constants, where Z is gonna be your atomic number, H is Planck's constant, N is the energy level, and the capital R is made up of all of these constants here. The mass of an electron, the permittivity of free space, and the atomic radius. These were all determined theoretically, but we'll see shortly that it also agrees with experiments. And because of that, we're going to just have one single constant that encompasses all the rest. So we can think of these energy levels as steps. A ball can transition from one step to another and can skip steps, but we always need to be on one. It cannot rest between the two steps. For instance, a step between 1 and 5 is going to require more energy than a step between 1 and 3. Electrons can move both up and down the energy levels. Now why am I giving you this analogy? Well, that's how the Rydberg equation was developed. We were able to look at the difference in energies as electrons were transitioning from one step to another. From here, we were able to, or by we, I mean Rydberg, was able to determine the energy levels of each transition. So what Rydberg was able to figure out is we can take the difference in energy being delta E equals E final minus E initial, and using the energies of transitions, he was able to derive this formula, where we have Rydberg's constant times Z, the atomic number, times one over N squared. We can then go back and forth between delta E and the two energy levels. Now, it would be nice if we had a one convenient equation that encompassed this transition, and we can do that once here and then just use the final results. So that's what we're gonna do. We know that the energy levels are defined here. We have that from Rydberg. So we're gonna derive the Rydberg formula the formula for the energy transitions from this formula. We know that the difference in anything is final minus initial, so we're gonna start from there. From here, we know that each one of these E's encompass this equation, and so we'll fill that in. I've just added the equation for each energy level into this equation, adding an F and an I where appropriate. From here, if you directly pull out any factors that are the same, and we could have pulled out Z as well, 
I just pulled out the negative RH here to get z squared over nf minus z squared over ni. Notice I also have this one. These are the exact same equation. There is nothing different about these. It's not that you use one in one particular case and the other in the other particular case. The only difference is whether this negative sign comes out or not. In this case, I have it out front, and so I have nf minus ni. Negative signs are very easy to drop, though, so many texts and websites will distribute the negative in, and then once you do that, rearrange, and so you end up with z squared over an i squared. So notice these reversed because you distributed the negative in, but they are exactly the same equation. So many people will try to use this equation in the case of, let's say, emission, in this case, in the case of absorption, and that is absolutely not correct. You need to make sure that you realize these are the exact same equation. Now, Rydberg's constant here is just a constant that encompasses all of the compasses that we saw in the Schrodinger equation. Because Rydberg found it experimentally, he found it as one value, and he didn't really know what that value meant. It wasn't until Schrodinger came along that we got to see what that value actually was. Now let's do an example where you transition from the n equals 5 to n equals 2 state. Notice here that we're asking for wavelength and not energy. So we're going to combine two different equations. Now I want to make a note here that there's many different ways to do this. You're, you can use the Rydberg equation in terms of energy, which is how I like to do it, and I'll talk about why I like doing it that way in the next couple of slides where it comes up more. Or you can use it, as it was originally derived, using 1 over the wavelength, which is how you'll often see it done in books. As we're going to start with the Rydberg equation, and we're going to use that to go to energy. From there, we're going to use the fact that energy equals hc over lambda to solve for lambda. So just drawing out a little map of what we're doing, which is always a good problem solving technique, because then it makes sense why we're using the equations we're using. So we'll write down the Rydberg equation first. Again, I prefer to use the form and energy, which I'll talk about why in a minute, and we'll fill everything in. Z is our atomic number, and so here, because we're talking about a hydrogen atom, it's just one. For the Rydberg equation, you need to make sure that you fill in the proper value. I give you three of them on your exam, and you can find quite a few different versions online. And the difference between all of these is the unit. Here, I'm solving for energy, and so my unit is joules. If I'm solving for 1 over wavelength, my unit will be 1 over meters. If I'm solving for frequency, my unit will be hertz. And so it just depends on which version of the formula you're using. We need to be sure that we use nf first because I chose to use this equation. And from here, we just have a bunch of numbers which we can fill in. But we know that our energy level difference, our energies between the two levels, is the same thing as the energy of the photon that is emitted. And so now we can use this to solve for lambda, rearranging that. over top of this value. Gives us a final value. And you could convert that into nanometers if you like, or you can leave it in meters. I will make one comment about sig figs in these problems. It's, it's kind of set by whatever you use for r. So here I picked r as 3. And so I should probably round this to 3 as well. However, you could have used a much larger amount of sig figs for R if you had looked it up, and therefore you could use more. Um, I don't tend to grade sig figs on these problems where I give you both the final and initial energy state because it's really up to you how many you use from the Rydberg formula. Before we move on to the next problem, we need to talk about some common sign issues that come up. This is a major cause of people making errors when they do the problems. So a free electron has a delta E equals zero, and that's just sort of something you need to know, and it doesn't actually come up a lot in this class. Because energy values are negative, N equals one is the lowest. Now this makes a little bit of logical sense, if we were going to design the system, we would want n equals 1 to be our lowest energy. It's our closest to our nucleus. It fills with electrons first. That's logical. 
Now let's think about what this means for delta E though. If you're going from a low energy up to a high energy, delta E is always final minus initial. So in a case of something like this where you're going from a one to a four or a two to a five, anything where you're going from a low energy to a high energy, overall your, your equation for delta E is gonna be final minus initial or high energy minus low energy. That would mean that it's gonna be positive overall because it's a high energy minus a low energy. Delta final minus delta, or excuse me, final minus initial. These sorts of cases involve the photon or the electron absorbing a photon so that it can go up in energy. And so you'll hear words such as photon absorbed. Now, what if we do the opposite? What if we go from a high energy down to a low energy? So now it would be emitting a photon because it's losing energy. It's emitting energy and falling down in energy. Here, if it's going from a five to a two or a four to a one, anything high to anything lower, when we look at delta E, which is always final minus initial, it's gonna be final, a low value, minus our initial value, a high value. So a low minus a high value overall means that delta E is negative. And so this comes up when you see either going from a high to a low energy, like five to two, or if you have words such as photon emitted because by it, by it falling down in energy, that energy has to go somewhere and so it comes off as a photon packet of light. Now let's look at the equation E equals H nu equals HC over lambda, either one of those. Notice frequency and wavelength will always have to be positive which means that this E is always gonna be positive. That makes sense from a math standpoint, as I just explained, but it also makes sense from a logic standpoint. This is the energy of a single photon. A single photon cannot have a negative energy, and therefore this must always be positive. This comes into play when you're talking about problems where you're going from, when you're going from a high energy down to a lower energy. So for instance here, we have a photon that is emitted when a hydrogen atom undergoes a transition to the n equals two level. Now it's worth noting, it's always good to kind of write down what things mean as soon as we see it. So right here, we know that it's undergoing a transition and it's ending up in the n equals two level. So we already know that nf equals two and we can write that down right away. I tell you that its frequency is this. So find its initial energy level. So there's a few different ways to go about this. Again, I like using the energy level equation for the Rydberg formula. And now we can kind of see why. It's going to force us to make a decision about the delta E sign at some point. The other equations don't ever make you make that decision within the equation. You can solve the entire equation without having to decide that. And so I prefer to use the delta E version. But first, we need to make sure that we can get delta E. And so we know that delta E, in this case, is gonna be negative. So we know that right off the bat. We also know that the energy of the photon that's emitted is equal to H nu. We can go ahead and solve this if we want. ahead and solve this if we want. But what will happen is if we try to fill in the value that we just solved for for E into delta E, we're not going to get a whole number for N. And that's a that's a helpful thing about these problems is it, rec it helps us recognize that something's wrong if we do it wrong, usually. Well, what we need to recognize is that this is E, not delta E. It's actually the negative value of delta E. So here we have negative E equals delta E. So we need to fill in a negative value. And from here we can solve for Ni. We know that our Nf is two, so I have two squared. We need to solve for Ni. For Ni, I'm not gonna do that algebra out for you. Um, you need to, play around with this and make sure that you understand how to do the algebra in the way that works best for you.
If you're having problems with it, I'm happy to help you in office hours. So from here, we have ni equals four. If you had done this and forgot to make this negative, you'd have come out with something that wasn't a whole number and you would know that you made a mistake and you need to go back and figure out what it is. Now we did a very quick review of the Bohr model of the atom, but we got to go into more detail about the actual energy levels. And we, now we know how these levels were figured out by Schrodinger theoretically, by Rydberg experimentally. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about spectroscopy and those aspects, the non-math aspects of it here in later podcast too. And we also derived the Rydberg equation and showed two of the forms that you'll regularly see it in books and discuss how you'll also see it in one over lambda terms. And you'll also sometimes see it in terms of frequency too.